Good morning and welcome. My name is Colin Mayer. I'm the academic lead for the British Academy Future of the Corporation programme. And it's my very great pleasure to welcome you to this, the first of three panels in the Future of the Corporation Summit on the role of educating education in promoting purposeful business. The Future of the Corporation final report, which was published yesterday, focuses on the public policies and business practices that are needed to implement purposeful business. But this will not happen without the right business and leadership skills. And that requires appropriate education of future practitioners and leaders. We look at three aspects of this. The first one is this one on the role of the professions. The second, which will be at 3 p.m. UK time this afternoon, is on universities. And the third, at 11 a.m. UK time tomorrow, is on business schools. The professions, namely accountants, auditors, actuaries, lawyers, insolvency and tax practitioners, consultants, investors, financial services providers, etc., have at least two key roles to play in promoting purposeful businesses. The first is through the advice, assistance and services that they themselves provide to companies and institutions. And second, through the education, training, professional qualifications and certification, they offer current and future entrepreneurs, managers, leaders, investors, and regulators of purposeful businesses. We'll be exploring all these aspects in this panel. And I'm delighted to be able to introduce the moderator of it, Tarogan Subaroyan, president of the British Accounting and Finance Association. He is professor of accounting at Essex Business School and past president of the African Accounting and Finance Association. Tarogan will introduce today's panel and panelists. And so welcome to Robin and thank you for mod moderating today's session. Over to you. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Colin, for the introduction and also to the British Academy for the opportunity to, to moderate this uh, very important session following the publication of a third report on purposeful business. Um, in my capacity as a president of the British Accounting and Finance Association, but also as a researcher in, in governance and accountability uh, um, across in different countries, I, I, I very much uh, look forward to the, to the conversations and, and to, the, to the debate around uh, uh, the role of the professions in, uh, in, in, in putting forward these ideas of purposeful business. Um, as, as, as Colin has mentioned, there's a lot of uh, um, there's a lot, there's been a lot of debate. There's been a lot of proposals, uh, wide ranging uh, regulation, ownership, measurement, finance, various aspects. And now the subject is about implementation and how uh, these uh, very important elements of purposeful business and principles of purposeful business can be implemented. And within that, uh, within my own kind of um, research, uh, is, is that the role of the professions. Uh, professionals of any in those particular aspects uh, and, and disciplines that, that Colin has just mentioned um, are very crucial uh, in terms of what I call the cognitive pillar, the way that, 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 that change happens in organizations is through the, cogni the cognitive pillar of, 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 of training, of, of the, culture, the values and the culture of these professions and how they are then transmitted to all around organizations, all around the world, internationally and globally. So I think um, in terms of, not only in terms of legislation, not only in terms of, of, of companies giving examples, I think uh, the, the role of the professions and education more generally is quite, is quite crucial in this respect. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be, to be part of that and, and to see how we, we can all contribute. So I have with me uh, today uh, four uh, uh, great speakers, who are going to intervene uh, on the subject, particularly the questions around obviously the role of the professions uh, in, in providing an enabling environment, 
the role of the professions in, in thought leadership around purposeful business, the role of the professions in continuous professional development, and, uh, some, and to a large extent as well, the role of professions in terms of their own qualifications, the qualifications that they, that they accredit uh, um, across the world. So um, I will mention the names of, of our speakers. Uh, uh, we have uh, Mrs. Sharon Machado from the ACCA. Uh, we have uh, Mrs. Sophia adams Batty from Simmons Wavelength. Uh, we have Tan Sui Che from the Institute of Faculty and Actuaries. And finally, we do have uh, a, a final speaker, which unfortunately hasn't yet been able to join us, is uh, Mr. Richard Gillingwater from Janice Henderson. And we hope he can, he can come uh, as we move on with the rest of the discussion. So um, each of these speakers will speak for about five minutes. And I'm also um, uh, looking at your, at your posts on the, on the, on the Slido, on the, on the comments at the bottom of the screen but you can put comments and obviously put questions. And as these questions go up, you can like those questions so that these questions, I can then convey them to the panel after they have made their opening remarks of about five minutes each, okay? So that's the, the, the process and we hope to be able to, uh, to, to complete within the hour. And then at the end, uh, I will hopefully bring up a, a conclusion and invite uh, Professor Colin to say a final few words. So, Without further ado, I'll, I'll start by uh, introducing our first speaker. Uh, first speaker is uh, Sharon Machado, SCCA from the SCCA. He's a she's a portfolio head of business reporting at the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. Sharon is the port uh, is uh, and a team generate future looking for leadership research and shape policy that has the aim of driving better business through the work of professional accountants. The types of issues addressed are broad ranging uh, that, that, that we try to do in the SCCA, ranging from the future of business reporting and audit, sustainability and integrated thinking, technology to transparent ethical business. I'm very much obviously very familiar with the work of the SCCA myself, given uh, as an educator and researcher uh, in accounting. So Sharon, uh, please, the floor is yours for, for five minutes on, on these questions we've raised. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and it's great to, to, to be here talking about a really important topic. Um, I'll try and do it justice in the short time that I've got. Um, but, but fundamentally, I think that um, in terms of what our role is, you know, in terms of shaping the profession, it starts off with, you know, there, there are three kind of key steps for me. Um, firstly, defining what we mean by purpose um, and engaging on it and getting that common understanding is incredibly important. Um, in 2020, I published a piece of research, Accountants, Purpose and Sustainable Organisations, which um, actually very much aligns with the, the, the output from the Academy yesterday. And it starts off by talking about, well, purposeful business um, is a sustainable one. And so therefore, it's it's an organisation that's being a good corporate citizen, you know, that's meeting the goals of economics. You know, we are in business to make profits and we can't forget that. But actually recognising that that has to be done in the context of meeting social requirements and, of course, environmental ones. And what we see is that ethical and sustainability in the context of innovation is incredibly important and digital has a major role in that. Now, gaining that common understanding of that, what, what purpose means, um, you know, we do via engagement and that's an incredibly important part in the definition and also the rollout of the profession. So with members, partner organisations and other professions are incredibly important too. So with lawyers, sustainability experts, particularly important with environmental matters, technologists to develop the systems that we need to make sure that we're integrating social and environmental issues into those that are related to um, profit, of course. Um, and of course, data is incredibly important in, 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 in all of that. So my, my step two then is that once we know and we have a common understanding of what purpose is, is linking it very specifically to the role of the profession um, um, that needs to act on behalf of not just business, but more broadly society. Um, and when we talk about accountants very uh, specifically, the, the, the role of accountants is fundamentally unchanged. It's about creating value, protecting the value that's been created, reporting, and then um, assuring on it. 
However, when we're talking about value, we're talking about value being much more than something that's financial. And um, a report that we have coming out at the end of this month, um, um, professional accountants at the heart of sustainable um, organizations really talked about accountants needing to be those ethical, sustainable business and finance professionals. And what they're doing therefore is integrating within their role of strategy, investment, business model, finance, um, reporting and, and, and assurance is matters of the environment and society. So throughout an organization's value chain. So from suppliers of raw materials, all the way through to end use um, by consumers of an organization's products. Now, the way in which we do this and see our role is, is, is actually a number of ways, actually. Firstly, through our research, which is the horizon scanning piece, where we identify what the big issues are that are coming down, down, down the line, the impact for the profession, and actually what our response should be. For, so, but firstly as members, then through our qualification and continual professional development to ongoing monitoring. And unfortunately, there does need to be um, a stick in, in, in all of this to make sure that members and our affiliate organisations are doing what they're supposed to do. But actually also in ACCA's own business model. So we have to be that role model too. And another key part of what we do is around policy. So shaping regulation and standard development. And there's a huge amount that's coming out at the moment, um, both for business and for um, accountants themselves, providing actually the tools to make sure that the strategy is implementing or can better implement purpose. Um, and, and then for the reporting and the assurance. Now, what is it that we're actually doing? So firstly, in terms of engagement, so the relevance and advocacy is an incredibly important part of that um, to make sure that our members are enlightened. And we tend to use our council members and our international assembly and have it as part of their key role. Skills development, so sharing our research, developing um, qualification and CPD. Touching on the role model piece, at ACCA, we've had integrated reporting since 2012, um, and that outlines actually our risks, our processes, and actually what we do in relation to the environment. Capacity building is another incredibly important area. So recently, in terms of developing economies and the profession elsewhere in Afghanistan and Rwanda are two perfect examples. In terms of monitoring, we've got our code of conduct um, and evidence of compliance must be there by our members. And unfortunately, there are repercussions of not meeting our standards. And finally, just making it very, very easy to um, implement through improved employer schemes, student support, member support, guidance and resources. That was a really whistle stop tour. So hopefully I haven't overrun by too much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon. I'm, I'm sure you've, you've kind of raised a number of things that we can probably uh, elaborate a little bit uh, later on. Um, but I will invite our, our second speaker, uh, Sophia Adams, uh, uh, Sophia Adams Patti, uh, uh, Head of Strategy and Policy at Simon's Wavelength. Um, Sophia is a public policy expert with over 20 years experience working at, uh, a number of, across a number of sectors, including law, financial services, competition, consumer affairs, healthcare and immigration and asylum. She's currently the head of strategy and policy at Simon, Simon's Wavelength, where she leads on the intersection of law, technology, and policy. Previously, she was a director of policy and regulation at the Law Society of England and Wales. So I think this is moving on from the accounting, I think is, is the legal perhaps um, um, element of what, what um, uh, connects to purposeful business. Over to you, Sophia. Oh, thank you so much. And hello, everyone. It's really delightful to be here today. And congratulations to the team, um, Colin and co, for the launch of the report yesterday. Um, there's some amazingly profound and important messages in there, which I hope that we will, once we have time to digest the detail, are able to think about how we might make our own role and part in that. So what I might do in the few minutes I've got is to look at this question from a slightly different perspective from Sharon's, but with the lens of legal, which is the, the, the profession I'm most embedded in now, or I most recently have worked in both in the professional space and, uh, and in education. And what I would say is to start with the, with the simple fact that actually education is a vital link in what I call the supply chain of thought and values. Right? For the professions, that's the heart of it, because that's where we train and build and 
morph and evolve the people that go on to then become the leaders of the profession to become the role models but on the day-to-day -day BAU activity they're the people that do the day-to-day -day work they're the people at the table with the client playing that trusted advisor role but the other piece that education plays is the normalization of values the bringing into and I love the description uh, earlier the cognitive pillar can I just I will I will always use it but I will always mention that it was your phrase not mine um that that actually that normalization of values is it normal for a lawyer to sit at the table and say that's a really interesting um point dear client x can we look at that from a sustainability perspective even if sustainability was not even on the agenda now, historically, that hasn't been something that is embedded and imbued in the educational track. And the reason being is twofold. One, Sharon, you talked about it a little bit when you described that actually the very nature of the profession hasn't necessarily changed, but it also has changed. What I might call the societal legitimacy, the license to practice but not in the traditional regulatory frame your social license to practice the values underpinning that purpose i.e your purpose as a profession in society has evolved and unfortunately i think it's going to take time before our educational capabilities whether that be academic or vocational are going to catch up and i think we might need a bit of a spur so just looking very briefly at at the legal education track what I see and what I think most people would agree is fairly common across the professions is a credibility gap between focus on the thing that people used to value above everything else, which is the technical knowledge. And the almost entirely focused curricula on that technical expertise. Now, that's not to say that there aren't modules and and programs either at the academic stage or in vocational training that look at more holistic learning but actually when we look really deeply and carefully in the main they're on the fringe they are not mainstream and that leaves us with a capability and a capacity gap the capability gap is this we don't train and expect our professions to act in a holistic way to give advice in a holistic way. And I saw some research a number of years ago that was done jointly by, I think, Lexus, Nexus and Judge that said general counsels, who are generally the sort of the, the key client for a law firm, they don't really want transactional lawyering anymore. They want relationships. But what we saw was a gap in the capability of the skills that we were training people for, either pre Pre, um, pre employment or during employment, a gap between what they thought was prized, which is technical great transactional knowledge, and actually what clients need. Now, interestingly, and this comes on to another point which I'll, which I'll touch on in just a moment, it's the client's voice in this, which I think might be, I spoke about earlier, a potential spur. So, historically, education has focused on what I might call the ex ante assurance of a set of technical skills but not much broader. There are some glimmers of hope and light. I will speak of my, uh, my own alma mater. Maybe that's a, I'm abusing my position a little bit, but I was at Birmingham and I thoroughly enjoyed my legal studies there. But it's interestingly talking to the head of, of the law school there, they've introduced a core module into year one um, that looks at uh, law, justice and ethics. That's one module. <laughs> there are, exceptional what I might call after school clubs that those people who are already predisposed to think about and be connected with sustainability in its more broadest sense or purpose in its broadest sense might choose to but there's no expectation either in the language or the standards or the regulation or the role modeling that says to those who are coming through the profession that this is an expected part of your job and if we don't change those norms, I talked about normalization of values earlier, we don't change those norms, we don't enable us to tap into the potential that lives within the professions. And this is a point I really want to focus on a little bit here, which I'm sure we'll come on to. Professions sit in a very trusted space. They can have honest conversations with their clients, clients can have honest conversations with them. And it's in that trusted space that the opportunities lie with the ability 
to pause and ask people to think again. So how do we make the significant change? I will drop three quick headlines and we will cover the rest in conversation. One, I think, is to bring together the best practice of all of these out of school clubs, so to speak, and try to make those mainstream. And that is by taking away the need to bespoke educational tracks, creating standards. And you might even say quasi regulation, which is where professional bodies come into 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 the mix. There is a very strong demand side lever here. If clients want it, employers will give it which means they will recruit for the right sort of talent and they will engender and nurture the right sorts of behaviours. And finally, the one that I'm particularly most interested about is how do we bring together and can we bring together bridging the supply and the demand side? So the educational tracks, both in academia and vocationally, so that's the educationalists and the employers working collaboratively with businesses themselves to try and form ways of which ways in which the professions can play a more active and supportive role for those businesses that are already beginning to think about these issues and those that have yet to. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Sophia. I think I, I appreciate some of the very good points. I think um, I will come back to those about about uh, something about the public interest that I want to perhaps raise later on. But we'll we'll, we'll get to that. I will now um, uh, uh, move on to our our third uh, our third speaker. Uh, uh, Tan Sui Che. Uh, he is currently the immediate uh, past president of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and member council of, uh, uh, of, account, uh, of, the, of the association of the Institute. Uh, Sui Che sits on the boards of Singapore University of Social Sciences, uh, Sim Ki Boon Institute of Financial Economics, LSE Trust in Singapore, Singapore School of the Arts, and various boards of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. He has a first class honors degree from the London School of Economics and a master's degree from Columbia University in New York. And obviously for all of us, obviously he represents uh, our evaluation of pensions, which is always uh, an interesting question we have. So without any further ado, Tan, please, please go ahead with your intervention. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me to be part of this panel. And I, uh, what uh, Sophia said just now really resonates with me uh, about the loss uh, of the specialization of the profession. And consequently, uh, I would like to argue that um, they have lost the ethical cloud, which they had uh, 50 years ago. And my story was about, in 1970, if you want to authenticate a photograph when you apply for a British passport, or if you want to certify a document in Malaysia, you go to a professional, a bank manager, an accountant, a lawyer, an auditor, but not anymore because we have become too technocratic, too skilled, but we have lost our standing uh, in an ethical and trustworthy aspect. The professions were the ethical towers 50 years ago. And what has happened since then? There's enough happening uh, in accounting, auditing and governance failures, in financial scandals, in mis-selling and very self-serving behaviors in the financial services industry. And accountants, lawyers, actuaries, tax advisors, uh, risk management professionals are at the heart of it. I've been asked to comment on enabling environment, uh, CPD, and integrating notions of purposeful business. And I could uh, talk about what we do in IFOA, the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries and Regulation and Ethics, positioning, uh, uh, and also responding to external contacts and also things in the pipeline. But I thought that uh, maybe we should take a step back, take a step back and, and really ask us, ourselves what problem are we trying to solve? Uh, and what role we can play as human beings and as professionals? Uh, and I would like to maybe set a scene by saying just uh, 10 points. Uh, Point one, the ecological and sustainability challenges we face today are systemic and threaten the survival of humanity. And I don't think it's controversial. Two, our politics have become more ideological, more fundamentalist, more nationalistic, and more populist, and less effective and less purposeful. Three, never in living memory has social 
inequality been so deep and exposed, planetary conditions so degraded, and political systems so broken. Four, the problem we have today are systemic and wicked. Systemic problems require systemic interventions, not systematic interventions. Wicked problems require clumsy solutions and we need practical wisdom, phronesis. Five, no one holds the key to change, not a single government, not a single profession, not a single organization, not least a single individual. Six, politics will respond to civil society. Professions and corporations have big roles to play. And so do the people. There are many good analysis and answers out there at different levels. But who is doing the listening? Who has articulated a theory of change? Seven, we have pluralism and diversity of paradigms. We have to change the paradigms we are operating in. As Tomasi said, if you want things to stay as they are, everything will have to change. This is an inch by inch fight. Eight, systematic intervention requires courage, imagination and conviction. And we also need humility and judgment. Nine, the work is simultaneous on all levels of work, as described by Elliot Jacks. We have to expand our time horizon. We have to be multidisciplinary. We have to, we have to arouse purpose, goodness, morality, and consciousness within us, as described by Donella Meadows in Systems Thinking. Ten. Deep engagement and dialogue across all segments of society is key. For the professional, it is the awakening of our consciousness, our obligation, and our ethics. We need to cause, engender, and arouse an inner movement of our conscience and manifest it as a public morality. As we walk into the streets of life, and public debate. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Tan. I, I think I think it was a very um, important call, uh, almost a heart and the head kind of uh, call about about what's happening um, uh, to the whole system. And I I, I certainly um, uh, join those those comments and agree with those comments. Uh, thank you for for your intervention. Um, we we have. Uh, just in time, our fourth uh, speaker has been able to join us. Uh, Richard, are you are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you for, for joining. Uh, I know it's not been easy in the last few minutes. Um, yeah. So um, um, I, if you don't mind, I'm just going to introduce you. And uh, yeah. we, we've gone through, a, a, you, you're the last speaker, so that, that kind of yeah. fits perfectly. So uh, uh, Richard Gillingwater uh, is the chairman of Janice Henderson. Uh, he's also been uh, um, uh, currently a non-executive has been a non-executive director and chairman of Janice Henderson since May 2017. In his non-executive career, he's been chairman of CDC Group PLC and SSC PLC, and has also been a non-executive director of PNO Debenhams, Tompkins, Kinetic Group, Kiddle Hiscox Limited, Helical PLC, and W.M. Morrison Supermarkets PLC. Richard holds uh, an MA in jurisprudence from Oxford University and is a qualified solicitor. So, uh, Richard, if you have about five minutes to, to give yes. your thoughts about on what today's discussions around the role of the professions, and yes. then we'll have an open discussions. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Let me start with an apology uh, for um, my connectivity problems. Um, and I'm sorry that I've missed the earlier remarks. Um, but first of all, thank you for inviting me to uh, join this panel. And I thought what I would do is, although I'm a, I am a lawyer by background, um, I thought that what I would do is um, speak more broadly uh, about the professions and purpose from my sort of corporate perspective, uh, which you've outlined. And I'd, I'd really like to make um, three fairly simple points. And forgive me if um, these are probably going over ground that the other panelists have, have said. But first of all, um, 
just to state the obvious that professional service firms play a hugely important role in supporting the corporate sector and in helping build trust, not only uh, in conjunction with the corporate sector, but also obviously more broadly with capital markets and uh, economies. And from my research, many leading uh, firms have a clearly stated purpose, and this is particularly the case with the major accounting firms. Um, but it's actually quite striking that many don't. And this is particularly the case, it seems, um, in a number of the le leading law firms and actuaries, and, and um, I haven't really researched further than that. But I do think that um, all professional service firms uh, benefit, will benefit from the galvanizing and organizing effect of having a clear purpose. And I'd also add to that, and I've seen one or two quite um, innovative um, statements of purpose, uh, but also one or two firms that have actually got metrics to underpin that. And I would, I would um, also say that to the extent that um, those firms can introduce metrics as well to support their purpose, uh, then I think that is a good thing. Secondly, uh, it goes without saying that, that professional service firms play an important role um, in helping corporates deliver their purpose and understand the impact of their business decisions. And particularly, obviously, uh, considering the impact on stakeholder groups. And this is, you know, obviously in the context of providing highly high quality audits, supporting transactions, supporting fair remuneration, the whole issue of the quality of ESG uh, disclosure, to name but four topics. Um, and I, I, I have a particular experience at SSE of this where we um, were coming to a fork in the road in terms of our strategy and uh, a deep consideration of a change to the statement of our purpose and basically uh, looking to decide whether we should sell our retail energy business. This is the business that is now causing it's not SSE's business, but where the, all the troubles are in the gas market at the moment. And what was striking about, uh, first of all, that decision and then the, the process we went through was uh, the obvious difficulty of parting with a, a very, very long-standing element of the core. But also, though, the support that we received from our professional service firms in challenging us on how you know how that met the various stakeholder constituency requirements that we needed to think about and what i found very striking and we wrote this up as a case study in the report and accounts at some length which again is highly unusual but we thought it worthy of it but what i found striking was the way in which that that challenge that we got from the professional service firms who were working alongside us was, was so valuable. Um, thirdly, I think that um, corporates are actually increasingly interested in how engaged their professional service firm providers are with the topics of purpose, strategy and values, and particularly how those point into ESG. And it is, not, it, it is now a matter of real interest that um, we see as corporates, we see a reflection, if you like, of what we're trying to achieve back in our, amongst our professional service firms. So although I haven't listened to the, uh, the, the, the previous um, discussions, um, I would absolutely wholeheartedly support initiatives that um, obviously raise 
uh, levels of awareness about purpose, about ESG in professional service firms uh, for all the reasons I've talked about. Um, and then perhaps just one very final reflection, um, and, and this is a, a much broader one, but just um, may show how, um, in this case, a business school um, can actually um, have some impact. So during the, the global financial crisis, I was actually um, the Dean of Cass Business School. And um, uh, during that whole piece, there was an enormous introspection about the role of business schools. Uh, in terms of contributing to um, the crisis. And we did a, a full, um, uh, it wasn't difficult to do in many ways, but a full sort of analysis of, um, of, uh, some, of the, some of our deficiencies. And, and we found, I suppose, a number of things, but in this case, actually, uh, almost a sort of total void when it came to teaching business ethics. Um, and secondly, uh, very, very little em emphasis in a lot of the curricula, a lot of the courses on the importance and power of culture. Um, and, and we actually uh, took that incredibly seriously. I created a brand new role of Associate Dean of Ethics, now Ethics and Sustainability. Um, and I think uh, we overhauled all the curricula to embed uh, at least those two elements and many more as well. Um, and the other striking thing is that, that CAS, now it's called Bayes now, but CAS had a, and has a very vibrant community of um, business ethics academics. It had none when we faced into the uh, global financial crash. And I think, in many ways, there are some quite interesting parallels for the professions and I know the wider universities and business schools when it comes to, to thinking about purpose. So that's why I wanted to draw the parallel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you for your uh, presentation, uh, Richard. I, I, and just in time again, I think your, your perspective from the boardroom and, and also how this has impacted on perhaps your experience about uh, as to the business schools is, is quite crucial. Um, um, uh, thank you for all for your uh, all, well, more or less we stood to time, but we're a little bit late, but we still can obviously open up a bit more with discussions. I, I would like to start by kind of just saying very briefly that um, um, per, from my own perspective is that uh, for the last 20 years or, or so that I've been um, uh, involved in, in many academic fronts is, is the loss of institutions, is that institutions have been discredited gradually. <laughs> In many many contexts, political, social, institutional, and 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 unfortunately, in that in that process, professions as as institutions have also have been uh, seriously given some. I mean, you know, put into challenge as to what what they are for and what are they trying to do, given addressing the situation. So, I suppose one one question I might ask, uh, uh, but although I'm 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 coming obviously from an accounting background but I know this applies to uh, as as far as possible as professions more generally is whether uh, this idea of adding more knowledge you know uh, ESG and all of these things and and providing them as as additional um uh, uh perspectives but not challenging perhaps the the, the core aspect, let's say, profitability or, uh, you know, ways of working, is, is the corporation the best model of operation? Is that perhaps something that needs to be looked at? And, and I'm not talking about accounting in, only, I'm talking about obviously all the other professions. I don't know anyone wants to respond to that. I'm happy to go first. I think probably at a macro level, I'd say there is a cause, cause and rationale for both of those interventions right so one is one is actually quite near term okay so we talk about climate crisis but th that label isn't there just for fun <laughs> fast running out of time right and we just yesterday i was reading you know how many businesses particularly in the manufacturing sector are really going to struggle with meeting net zero um targets um and those sorts of interventions to help those businesses and those corporates meet those interventions in the near term hugely important but equally at the same time almost if you can hold two two narratives in your head at the same time 
there is the need to be questioning some of the broader conceptual frameworks of the purpose of the economy, um, the purpose of the role and the purpose of role of professions in contributing to that economic model. And I, you know, this particular program goes a hell of a long way in making people pause and just re center themselves on what the modern future looking sustainable future of a corporation might look like. Um, and I think, you know, the professions would do very well, all of them, in actual fact, to just reflect on this particular report with that, with that macro question at four, to say in, in this new world order that we're hoping to achieve with, you know, with a fair wind, what might our activating role be? And if I could just add to that, sorry, um, one of the things that um, I think all four of us were talking about um, very much so was this mindset change. So it's not for each of our respective professions to throw the, um, to coin a, a dreadful phrase, which I'll probably get wrong, the baby out with the bathwater. It is really about making sure that, you know, it's not about taking away the technical, because that's still really good, or introducing more content. It's about um, recognizing that in everything that you do, you're not looking at it from just one lens. You have to consider the wider stakeholder. When I'm talking about stakeholder from an accountancy perspective, I'm not talking about investors. I'm talking about your local community, which has become incredibly more important. You're talking about actually what impact are you having directly and indirectly through what your suppliers are doing or what your consumers are doing with your, your products on the, the, the environment. And I think once that mindset shift happens, then actually everything else will, 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 will follow with that, I think. Tan, I think you had your hand up. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Uh, I think this is a, a, a complex systemic problem, yeah. Uh, and we need to do the business ethics, we need to do the education uh, and raising a consciousness. But remember, uh, there's a lot of conflict of interest uh, and there is a lot of uh, wider narrative which needs to be rethought, yeah. Uh, Think of uh, the Kingman Report, think of Carillon, think of Pasteri, think of BHS, think of the Guptas, the Capsule, the Archivos, uh, all the professionals, the professional services firm are in the heart of it. So, so you can see how difficult it is because our economic narrative and the way we measure value uh, needs to be looked at. Yeah? Uh, and this is a complex problem and I do not pretend and I would pretend that we have the answers, but clearly, uh, this is very embedded uh, in the story on how we measure uh, value and profitability and what we maximize. And that is manifested. The day I walk into another, another company, it's about maximizing shareholder value and ESG will be seen at that light. Uh, and we got to engage at all levels. There is a change, uh, uh, partly because this narrative, uh, the Washington consensus of market fundamental Capitalism only emerged in the last 40 years, right? So things can swing uh, a bit differently. Uh, but the issue here today uh, is quite systemic and quite embedded, right? Uh, uh, and, and somehow we need to have an inch by inch dialogue on how best to do this because too many things are at stake. Uh, you can look at the Reef Lectures by Mark Carney. You can look at so many books written on the problem with uh, neoclassical economics, which is a narrative which we subscribe to and still govern uh, our regulations. Uh, I think this is great, you know, but I think somehow we need to find a way out of this fly in a fly bottle problem, right? To come out of that narrative and set up a new narrative. And it's not going to be something done in, in 12 months, but over five, 10 months, uh, five, 10 years, uh, because we start seeing changes and we need work at all levels. I think this is so embedded that you've got to attack at a high level narrative is about how we want to live as human beings in relationship to the planet. Yeah? Because the way we are going about it uh, is not going to be sustainable and our economic system is not helping. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. R Richard, Can I? You just... oh, sorry, go on Richard. R Richard. Well, I, I, I think what I would say here is um, to me, if I, if I draw this back to the, the discussion about professions, I think what Sharon said about mindset change is actually the, the really key thing here. Um, and it's, it's 
really about achieving that and recentering um, the thinking around that and then organizing the thinking out of that um, in the context of professional service firms and not just corporates. And so just to add to that, I'm really pleased to see the, um, and the pace of change might not be quick enough for some, but um, some of the developments that are happening, for example, out of um, Bayes on the future of um, audit and corporate governance. Um, similarly, you know, Europe is, is running at a pace with its corporate sustainability reporting directive and what it means for um, organisations and, and various professions um, is, 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 is an important one for us to, 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 to look at. Uh, thank you for that. I, I, I'm mindful that there are various questions coming through for you, uh, online. So we're not just, uh, it might look like we're in a bubble, but actually there are people actually commenting as well. So I might just put on some, some I think, I think there, there is part of a discussion here um, about, for example, how, you know, does, does the profession see this as, for example, the question is about the professions are we are we training people to to be or, or, or preparing people towards doing what the client wants, or do we want to be able to to, to speak truth to power in a sense? Um, is that is that is not necessarily a, 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 in my view anyway a, a kind of uh, either or situation? But I think that's one of the questions that I can see. Um, also, how do young people? I mean, that's an interesting question. Also, I mean, the young people jo joining the professions now do we have some sense as to whether themselves they see a different form of accounting or different form of accountant a different type of lawyer a different type of, of actuary and I, you know so i don't know whether this is something you can respond to can i can i just offer one thought here um i actually think um that uh, the, 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 one of the really, really big challenges we face, this is now pointing into ESG, is um, the absolute um, proliferation of different approaches and standards to, to thinking about ESG. Um, and, you know, as a result of that, the, you know, the, the really big questions we're, we're, we're all talking about here. Uh, for instance, um, the impact, you know, how you get to net zero. And I, I, I think if, if I was um, training as an accountant um, at the moment, thinking about this, I would be really quite galvanized about the uh, effect I might have uh, if I could feel that I was um, trying to bring a sort of unanimity of approach here um, and actually uh, part of uh, a group maybe developing um, a global standard here that actually gets commonly adopted. I think uh, there is a, an absolute sort of prof profound need for some uh, commonality of approach uh, rather than this sort of vast proliferation. Um, and then, uh, you know, using that, a, you know, really... Um, working with corporates to you know, to actually genuinely help them develop the the right uh milestones and and tracks if you like to get to net zero i mean i can't I, you know i've vivid um experience of this in the boardrooms and the single biggest issue we have is we make these declarations and we have a hazy view of how we might achieve net zero by 2030 gone through this debate you know but last week and we have a very hazy view um but we you know we absolutely need help inhaling mm. that down and not making it some sort of fuzzy half commitment and we're all we all want to do that that's the other irony of the situation so if if i was someone young coming into the profession um i feel i could have huge impact through that mm -hmm. I think one of the things that that really, I think, brings to the fore here is that knowledge gap, isn't it? And I think what Richard, you've just described is the plethora of um, content that any individual. So I work in a law firm at the moment and I advise clients on ESG. It, it takes almost my entire 
day job <laughs> to keep on top of what's happening yeah. before I get to help them with their with their actual strategic thinking. And the if you look at so I talked to I shan't name who a couple of um, academic um, leads across other universities recently to to look at whether or not they're preparing content wise people for this space and actually that's still not there so I think the moving the nascent nature of the the regulatory environment in which we're working makes this a little bit harder so to the first point about um, should the profession be there to challenge or just to do actually it has to be <laughs> to challenge because otherwise that, that that is not a value added um, contribution to the whole and anyone going into the professions would have always have thought that they would be adding value and the value there is to challenge that's what clients want they don't want a you know it may look like they want a quick answer but fundamentally they need a a challenge but to be able to challenge you need the competency and I fear that there is a significant gap at the moment. Sharon I think you wanted to say something? Um, I, I was going to touch on another aspect about um, the younger generations coming through, um, so I didn't want to switch over too much, but, but with the younger generations, we're definitely seeing a focus on actually, you know, um, purposeful business because that's one of the questions they ask when they come to interview um you know the first question it's not about how much am i going to earn or what are, you know what, what what are the tangible bits of my job it's where is your position on these particular matters that are important whether it's un sdgs whether it's you know other matters that are close to their hearts and with that what they're bringing with us is something that really helps close that knowledge gap because they are actually free to ask those challenging questions and they're comfortable doing so so there's there's a real benefit of actually having all of them and that multicultural organisation, which is something that's actually very much changed, I would say, in the last 10, 15 years. And that is something that we can kind of leverage on to, 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 to help bridge or sorry, close that, 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 that gap that's there. I would say just very quick reflection on that, Sharon. It feels to me that in order to retain that enthusiasm that comes into the profession, we need the top of the professions to be mirroring back some of this so interesting um uh, richard's sort of uh, quick study of who's got who's got a corporate purpose well articulated with metrics walking walking the walk not as well as talking to, and i think because once to to i think tan's point once you're in the system if the system isn't purpose-led actually that enthusiasm it wanes right there's only so much that you can we need it to be landing fertile spaces to allow those people to retain that enthusiasm as they make their way into the leadership roles. So, um, and, and I, I think that, that 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 is still a journey. Might be a diplomatic way of describing it. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And and the thing that's that's there as another plus side is that with social media, everything that's open, actually, it's very easy now to be caught out. So so if you're if it's not fully embedded, it, it's something that will at some point come out to bite you. Yeah. Definitely right. Yeah, I, I think certainly my own research into into uh, ESG reporting and disclosures has, has clearly showed that kind of gradually now a much more uh, you know realization this isn't anymore a, a PR exercise and and purpose statements in the same uh, in the same in the same direction. Uh, initial attempts at purpose statements have been reported to be very much a kind of slogans and 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 and, and not much behind it. So I think I. I kind of recognize Richard's kind of point here that, that I think as professions or as, as, as academics, we, we, we probably need to be more on, on how to, to support, um, you know, future graduates or future professionals into how they would, they would, they would um, attempt those tasks. You know, you know we, we, want, we have a purpose, now tell us what we need to do about it or how, how we need to embed this into, into the organization before, as Sophia says, we go into the normal nitty gritty of things before we go back to, yeah, we have a purpose, but we're back to, I don't know, return on investment or whatever, whatever type of other metrics that may be, uh, that may be here. Good. I, 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 I'm, I'm sort of looking for the questions, but, you know, we're also mindful of time. Um, um, there was, um, just a quick look on this. Um, where, where would you see, I think, I think probably more generally here is there's a question about, alternative ownership structures. Do, do you think that in a sense, our business education has been generally too much on 
on this. I, I can see Colin is back as well, but do you think that somehow our alternative, our education has been too much on the on the corporation as a, as a public company as opposed to other uh, ownership structures? If there's any quick response to that. I wonder if that's a reflection of kind of where the state of discourse has been for many years. And you would hope that this kind of a conversation would make people think actually the, the corporation plays a much more deeper role than simply a profit making en engine, but actually to reconnect it with something that we didn't really get a chance to talk about, the public value piece. But mm. I see Tan, you had your hand up, so I'm gonna stop. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think Tan, you have one minute before I, I kind of pass on back to Colin. Uh, no, I, I, uh, obviously uh, corporations have a role and, and I think that there are different levels of work, yeah, in system and level. And the question is what level of intervention is necessary to cause the systems to change, right? Uh, we can put purpose in our existing corporations. We could have ESG and carbon offsetting rules to be tighter. But the fundamental narrative of uh, what we are here for and how we live, uh, unless we have some kind of neutrality and reciprocity around a shared narrative, uh, we are going to be suboptimal. And the, the issue is uh, re reasonably urgent, but you can't force it as well because it's a highly pluralistic society. And, and no one, none of us have the answer, so to speak. So we need to learn how to construct the answer uh, by this kind of conversation. All necessary work. My, my question would be, uh, are, is what we are doing sufficiently fundamentally different to cause the paradigm to change, right? Uh, that would be my question, yeah? Uh, 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 thanks, thanks for the time. Thank you. Thank you very much to, to our speakers. Thank you, Tan, thank you, Sharon, Sophia, uh, uh, Richard, uh, very much. I know time is, is very tight and, uh, and uh, obviously it can be, we, can, we can probably have a long discussions about this. I, uh, wrapping up on this from, from my own perspective, from, the, from what I can see is this, this idea of, obviously professions are, I think, clearly uh, central, important. It's this um, trying the mindset. I think the key word I keep thinking is a mindset, the change in the way that we, we, we see uh, our future graduates or future professionals and how they would go uh, how, how would we move towards that sort of purposeful business and, and take that as the starting point? And there, there's probably a long, a long way, but I think there, there's certainly possibilities in, in how professions. Professions, in a sense, influence universities because uh, professional accreditation, uh, there's a lot of, uh, you know, often uh, uh, commonalities between what is being taught or what is being the thought leadership of professions and then how it ends up in business schools as well. So I think these are uh, usually interconnected. So I, without this, I, I think being mindful of time, I'll leave it to Colin to, to, to conclude on, 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 this, on this session. Jurovan, thank you very much indeed uh, for having moderated the uh, session so uh, brilliantly. Um, the focus of the British Academy report that was published yesterday is on implementation and accountability of corporate purpose. And clearly professional service firms should be at the forefront of both facilitating implementation by companies and helping businesses, their investors and stakeholders to hold themselves to account and to be held to account. And to do that, we've heard today how professional service firms need to have a clearly defined purpose themselves, promote corporate purpose in their clients and be willing to challenge their clients in relation to their purposes. But we've also heard, heard today that there's some concern about a failure of some professional service firms to have defined purposes, a uh, concern about a possible decline in a focus on ethics within professional service firms, a tendency towards rather technocratic advice, which is not sufficiently holistic in nature, and a proliferation of standards, which, is, which are confusing and without clarity about how they should in practice actually be implemented. So there's a clear challenge that's emerged, I think, from this panel about how professional service firms should, as was discussed, adopt the mindset that is needed by business, by their clients, and by the economy and society as a whole. So I think it's been an extremely productive and interesting discussion, which has raised many thoughts which are highly relevant to what we've been doing 
in this final report. I'd like to thank you, Taroven, Richard, Sharon, Sophia, and Tan, very much indeed for having led such a wonderful discussion. Thank you. And just before we go, we're going to end with a short film that records how a segment of the British public and some experts view the topics that we've just been discussing and the future of the corporation programme. So stay around for another two minutes. Thank you. provide stability to the employees that they've got. Something continually rolling to help within the community as well. Incorporate other brands that are, you know, are also doing the same sort of thing. Mental health care. We're willing to act charitably in our minds, but not really putting our words into action sometimes. I think it's really important for businesses to be transparent and that it's constantly, you know, rated. Corporations put their purpose at the heart of everything that they do, it will make them think very differently about their social and environmental impacts. So I think there's lots that we do in terms of the way in which we operate, from our carbon footprinting, we get that independently verified and 100% of our profits are given to all trade. I suppose the key thing about being purpose driven, it gives you that framework for the right sorts of decisions in order for you to fulfil that purpose. The challenge we have at the moment is that we need to rewrite the rules so that all businesses are behaving responsibly. We can't deliver on our purpose of providing sustainable long-term returns for our clients if we invest in companies who are seeking short-term profits and creating problems for society. If we want to build forward together, we have to have a sense of urgency across board. And we need to pivot very quickly to a model of capitalism that is regenerative and restorative. And we need new, bold, fresh ideas to frame how we build that new economy. And the future of the corporation is, is providing that insight and that intelligence.